life happens really fast. Really fast. In the 90 seconds or so that we were waiting for these precious lives to, to go to Kids for Christ, nearly 400 lives have entered this world. 267 per minute is the rate quoted by the world population folks of babies born every minute. Now, that might seem trivia, but, but, but let me explain what got me thinking that way. As I look around this room, and I see the, the different folks at all stages of life, from the youngest to the oldest, it's almost overwhelming to think about the vast number of experiences and memories that are re represented in all of you. It, it's incredible. Every single one of us is a life that's different than any other. And our personal experiences could fill multiple books. <laughs> yeah, but Andy, I'm not sure anybody would want to read them. <laughs> yeah, I get it, I get it. Let's be real. Even the most thorough of biographies and autobiographies of the most famous people of our world are condensed and much is, is, is condensed and, and, and edited out because most people don't have the time or maybe they don't have the willingness to read all the tiny details and nuances of somebody's life. The Word of God. This, this ancient book that has compelled, it has inspired, it has directed and revealed so much of the heart of God to so, to so many over the years, while at the same time, it has repelled, it has frustrated, it's discouraged, and it's alienated so many others. But friends, love it or hate it, the word of God is difficult to ignore and be neutral towards. Many try. There's a lot of statements that we hear like, oh, I was reading the Bible, but nothing ever changes, or it's boring, or it's about a bunch of people that no one remembers anymore. Oh, God didn't mean that. I know it says that, but he didn't mean that. And, and just about anything else we can think of. Yet every time we read this book, when we look carefully, we're going to find so much more than we could ever imagine. Insight, love, failure, redemption, hope, life, and the list goes on and on. For the past several months, we've looked at the life of Jesus. We looked at the I am statements he made about himself in the Gospel of John. Then we followed that with a couple months of looking at the first two chapters of the book of Acts where the early church came onto the scene and the Holy Spirit came and started this work of God called the church. In the month of October, it seemed appropriate to turn our pages back a little ways into the Old Testament. The record of God's work among his people before Christ came to us and specifically I'm going to be looking, we're going to be looking at the, a man by the name of Nehemiah. Some interesting circumstances that he found himself in, the unique work that God led him to do. It's the last book of history in the Old Testament, and it tells us not only Nehemiah's story, but so much more. It starts in what we call now modern-day Iran, but most of Nehemiah's story took place right where we left the early church in the second chapter of Acts in the city of Jerusalem. Today, it's a bustling city of over 900,000. Settlements, complexes all over the place. But in the heart of this modern architecture lies the old city of Jerusalem. It's divided into four segments, the Jewish, the Muslim, the Christian, and the Armenian. The, and you can kind of see the, the, the settlement there. Its population is tiny compared to the city outside the walls, about 40,000 people living inside the walls about a kilometer wide and a kilometer long. Ironically, the population in the old city of Jerusalem today is about the same as it was when Jesus walked on the earth. 40 to 50,000. Now during the holy days, the Jewish festivals, the population of the city would balloon, it would double, even triple, sometimes 180 to 200,000 people. But we're jumping back into time 
when the city of Jerusalem was not at its best. The story of Nehemiah shows us how God can do impossible things through people just like you and me. Because the city of Jerusalem was a mess. It was broken. And it was not a good situation. And God laid a burden on Nehemiah that we're going to learn about through this study. The kingdom of Israel, understand, was established around 1050 B.C. And about 100 years later, the Israel, the United Kingdom, had a civil war. And it splits into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Ten on one side, ten on the other. Then in about 722, the northern kingdom was destroyed by the hands of the Assyrian Empire. And God brought judgment on them for their idolatry and their unfaithfulness. Then about a couple hundred years later, tragically, in 586 B.C., the southern kingdom was overrun by Babylonians. They destroyed the city. They took the brightest and the best of those they didn't kill. And they took them hundreds of miles to the northeast to the land of Babylon. This too was allowed by God as judgment on the children of God's unfaithfulness. And 70 years pass. The Babylonians are replaced by the Medes and the Persians. They're the main power in the region. And it's interesting, about this time, some of their, lead, their leader begins to allow small groups of Jewish remnants, those who've been exiled, to go back to Jerusalem. They even allowed the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem, which finished about 516 B.C. And then we come to Nehemiah. His story starts in about 445, about 70 years later, after the temple was built. Nehemiah has heard stories about his homeland. It's been passed down from the generations past, but he's never been there. We see that one of his brothers got to go there, and that's where we pick up in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. Just FYI, this morning I'm going to be reading this text from the New Living Translation, the NLT just because I think it reads a little bit easier. So, start in Nehemiah 1. These are the memoirs of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In late autumn in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was at the fortress of Susa. Hananiah, one of my brothers, came to visit me with the other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who'd returned there from captivity, how things were going in Jerusalem. And they said, things aren't going well. Things weren't going well for those who returned to the province of Judah. They're in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem, remember in those days, any city had a wall around to protect from, from attacks. The wall has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. Verse 4, Nehemiah, when I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. Susa was about 700 miles from Jerusalem near the Persian Gulf, the modern day Iran. You can see it clear over to the right on the screen. Jerusalem is all the way over next to the Mediterranean Sea. It is a significant different difference. And when Nehemiah's brother comes back from Jerusalem with this discouraging news, Nehemiah was heartbroken. The walls around the city were in bad shape. Those in authority of the city had no desire to repair or rebuild. And those reasons will be made clear as we continue this study. But this news hits Nehemiah really, really hard. His job was a significant position. He was in the employ, actually a servant of the king. He was the cupbearer. And that is a very valued and trusted position because he not only chose the king's food and wine, he taste tested it before it was served to the king, so that if anybody tried to poison it, the cupbearer would die first. It's obvious his heart's concerned with matters greater than just his own life and happiness. He's got a burden, he's got a, a, a heart that is broken for the welfare of his homeland. And so when he gets this news, he doesn't just say, oh well, I hope they get it together soon. Uh-uh, God gives him a passion, a concern that burns in his heart. His heart is broken when he hears about what's happened to this once powerful, great, holy city. So he fasts, and he prays, and he pours out his heart before God. I'm thinking most of us have found ourselves at a similar place at one time or another. Our heart is touched. We see something, our heart is troubled. We're moved to compassion, we're moved to concern, and we pray. We mourn and we grieve because it seems evil has won the battle, and there's nothing we can do. 
what if we could learn some important lessons looking at the life of Nehemiah that might help us in our walk, in our relationship with God, as well as his plans and his purposes for our lives. I believe we can and I pray we will. In the opening verses of Nehemiah's story, we find one of those first lessons. He helps us to see that when God gives us a passion to do something for him, even if that seems impossible, the first thing we need to do is start where God gives us a concern. Okay, if he brings it to our heart, he brings it to our mind. Several of the ministries we as a church support started with an individual or a group of individuals who were moved to a concern and purpose to do something to make a difference. Boise Bible College, 75 years ago, 76 now, Orrin Hardenbrook recognized that there was the need for a place to train workers for the local church. And 75 years later, Boise Bible College is still training workers for the kingdom of God with graduates serving all over the world in so many ways. Thank God he gave this man a concern for the workers of the church. OICEA, how many of you remember that term? I'm thinking maybe one or two, but not many because it's been a long time ago. The Oregon-Idaho Christian Evangelistic Association is now known as the ICPA, the Intermountain Church Planners Association. You've heard of that. We support them. But the OICEA started when a few elders from a few small churches in Idaho and Oregon said, you know what, there's a lot of churches around us, a lot of towns around us that don't have churches. They do not have New Testament Bible-believing churches. But we need to do something about that. So they, they went together, pooled resources and energy, and started the Church Planning Association. And now, over 40 years later, nearly 40 churches have been started or helped to start by the ministry of the ICPA. I knew several of those founding members. And I don't think they could have ever imagined how many churches, including three to four of them that run three to 4,000 people a weekend. I don't think they could have imagined what God had in store when they gathered and met and started this work of God. Thank God he gave those men a concern for new churches. Anybody heard of MCEA? Minidoka Christian Education Association, a youth director and a few members of his church and friends in the community from other churches in the late 70s saw a need and the potential of educating students right there by the high school. Not just reading, writing, and arithmetic. Yeah, that's all, folks. No, no. Not just reading, writing, and arithmetic, but also the word of God. And the ministry still continues still today. Thank God he gave those folks a concern for educating students. Intermountain Christian Camp. A group of ministers and camp counselors saw a need for a place to hold summer camps and retreats year-round that they didn't have to get on a list and hope they could be fit into some open time in a rental situation. And the opportunity was presented and they jumped. And 28 years later, they just finished another really, really good season of summer camps. And they have retreats scheduled pretty much, I'm thinking three to four weekends a month. Thank God he gave those people a concern for camp. Each and every one of these ministries started when somebody saw a need. And they prayed. And God led them to attempt what others thought was impossible. That's what Nehemiah did. He reminds us to start where God has given a concern. Then we continue, picking back up in verse 4. When I heard this, the news of what happened in Jerusalem, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. And then I said, O Lord God of heaven, of the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love and obey his commands, listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people Israel. I confess... We've sinned against you. Even my own family and I have sinned. We've sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, the decrees, and regulations you gave us through your servant Moses. Please remember what you told your servant Moses. If you're unfaithful to me, I'll scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, then even if you're exiled to the ends of the earth, I'll bring you back to the place I've chosen for my name to be honored. Don't you love it when you remind God of promises he's made? 
That's what Nehemiah is doing here. The people you rescued by your great power and strong hand are your servants. Oh Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those of us who delight in honoring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put it in his heart to be kind to me. In those days, I was the king's cupbearer. This is Nehemiah's words as he writes. And here we see the second step. The next step after God gives you a concern for something that needs changing. This might be the hardest of all. We need to spend time praying, fasting, and waiting. I struggle with the waiting part. But what was Nehemiah's response to the bad news? He mourned, he wept, he fasted, he prayed. There's some important instructions for us here. Before you go out to accomplish anything for God, you need to spend time on your knees. You need to be praying and clarifying what it is God's calling you to do. Before you go out to change the world, to do the impossible in his name, you've got to take time to pray, to fast, and to wait. Because otherwise, you could be gone ahead of him. What is fasting? In the Bible, fasting is a spiritual discipline of going without food for a period of time. It helps us focus on prayer, God's word, and seeking insights and truths from God without distraction. Instead of feeding ourselves, we seek to fill, for God to fill us with his spiritual food, his direction, his guidance. So Nehemiah fasts. And while he's fasting, important things happen. He begins to realize the problem of the people left in Jerusalem are partly his fault. What? All of this happened long before he was born. Still, he begins to confess the sins that he and his house have committed in addition to all the people of Judah that have brought them to this place of disgrace. And as he waits upon God, as he prays, as he fasts, God does surgery on Nehemiah's heart, purifying of any pride and judgmental attitudes toward those in Jerusalem, realizing none of us are worthy to stand before a great and holy God. We all need his mercy in his favor. This took place for some time. His story begins in the month of Kislev, which is December. And chapter 2 tells us when he finally goes in to bring wine to the king and speaks to him, it's the month of Nisan or April. Four months have passed. Four months. Most of us have a hard time waiting four minutes, let alone four months for God to clarify his plans for us. But Nehemiah prayed. He fasted and he waited. Then he prayed, he fasted, waited some more until... God opened the door. So we continue in our text, verses 1 through 9 of Nehemiah 2. Early the following spring in the month of Nisan, during the 20th year of our King Artaxerxes' reign, I was serving the king as wine. I never, never had appeared sad in his presence. So the king asked me, why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. <laughs> then I was terrified. But I replied, long live the king. How can I not be sad? For the city where my ancestors are buried is in ruins and the gates have been destroyed by fire. Verse four is huge. The king asked, well, how can I help you? With a prayer to the God of heaven, I replied, if it please the king and if you're pleased with me, your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. The king with the queen sitting, sitting beside him said, asked, how long will you be gone? When will you return? And after I told him how long I'd be gone, the king agreed to my request. I also said to the king, if it please the king, let me have letters addressed to the governors of the province west of the Euphrates River, instructing them to let me travel safely through their territories on my way to Judah. And please give me a letter addressed to Asaph, the manager of the king's forest, instructing him to give me timber. I'll need it to make the beams for the gates of the temple fortress, for the city walls, and for a house for myself. And the king granted this, these requests because the gracious hand of God was on me. When I came to the governors of the province west of the Euphrates, I delivered the king's letters to them. The king, I should, should add, also sent along army officers and horsemen to protect me. Here's the third lesson we learned from Nehemiah in this text. And that's when God opens the door be bold. Be bold. God, Nehemiah spent four months praying, fasting, waiting for God to make clear what he's supposed to do. And evidently he'd done a good job of hiding his concern and his sorrow from the king. But on this day, 
Remember, a day he prayed would happen since he prayed the king would listen favorably. The king notices a difference in his expression, in his countenance. And he asks him, what's the problem? Cupbearer to the king was a great job. Important job. A very comfortable position for Nehemiah to be living in. Yet, understand, he, Nehemiah couldn't just one day decide, oh, you know what, I'm going to look for something better. I'm going to resign, I'm going to look for a better job with better pay. That wouldn't happen. His life was at the pleasure and the request of the king because he was his servant. Basically a slave. And Nehemiah's response in verse 2 indicates just that. He was afraid. He knew it was within the king's power to dismiss him. Put him in jail or even take his life if the king was led in such a way. And the last thing Nehemiah wanted was for the king to think he was upset or mad with the king himself. That was treason. So he was terrified when he realized the king was concerned. And yet he didn't allow his fear to paralyze him. He assured the king of his loyalty. And then when asked about his sadness, he shared what was going on. This isn't common. And it was probably the first time Nehemiah had had a conversation, a personal conversation with the king like this. But then the king asked, what do you want? What can I do? And that was the opening Nehemiah had been praying for. And now, notice he prayed again before he continued. First he asked for the time off, which again, servants don't get time off. Okay? And understand, the journey to Jerusalem is several months long. And the time to to rebuild a city back to a semblance of what God had originally planned, that was going to take some years. This was a big commitment. And when he sees that the king is open to this request of years from a service, he goes further and asks, well, could you provide the materials? Give us the letters that will get us there safely. Provide the materials. And, and he asked for it. And he got it. There's another thing here that we need to see. And during Nehemiah's season of waiting and prayer and fasting... Nobody knew what he was doing, but he was getting th- things in his mind put together. He was making plans for what to do if and when God opened the door. So when God opened the door, he was ready. As he stood before the king, he wasn't making it up. He had specifics in mind. Granted him. Testing, testing, one, two. Testing, testing, one, two. Stage mic on. Testing. (laughs) Okay. He wasn't making it up. He had plans in mind. He knew what it was going to take. And if he got the opportunity, he was going to ask. And he asked boldly. If we're ever going to do the impossible for God, there's going to come a time when our praying and our waiting has to turn to action. God's going to provide the opportunity. Even though we might feel afraid, we need to have the courage to swallow hard, move through that fear to ask for what we need. When this happens, the impossible becomes possible because only God, only God can make it happen. There have been times I thought I knew what was needed and I had a plan, but when I tried to implement that plan, God had an answer. And usually it was not yet. Once in a while it was no, but usually it was not yet. But when God opens the door, watch out. Watch out, be bold, because we don't want our tiny faith to limit our awesome God's work. And he'll do it in ways that we never expect it to happen. A friend of mine felt God was calling him to move his family to a different city. To plant a church of all things. He was a a student minister as well as a, a high school coach. 
and a very successful coach. And once the plans and the people were in place to make this change, to move to a different state, to start this church, there was still a big factor that was in the way of it all happening, and that was the funding. But the majority of it came from a place he never anticipated or expected. Like I said, he was coaching for the local high school. And, and one day at one of the meets, there was some downtime, and one of the parents of one of his team members was talking to him and, and uh, complimenting him on what a good job he was doing with the team and the kids. And he's like, so what are your ultimate goals? Do you always want to be a, a youth pastor or, or do you have something else in mind? I know you're a, a teacher too. You have your credentials to teach. And, 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 and my friend, without hesitating, said, if I could do anything I wanted to do, I would move to northern Idaho to start a church. Why? That was the parents' reaction. Why? You have a potential state champion team here year after year. Why would you leave after you've built this program up in such a way? Because God has made it clear to me that's what I'm supposed to do. So when I can raise the funds, it's going to happen. And the conversation went back and forth, and before long, the parent, who was a very successful business owner in the area, wished him well. They went on with the meet, and... Uh, Everything was good until a few days later that parent contacted my friend and said, you know, I've been thinking more about what you shared and, and I, I think that I'm supposed to help you. My friend was surprised and yet not because this is so God. It's just how he works. And so my friend said that the parent, he was telling us, the parent said, would a donation of $20,000 help? That would have been my response is, wow. Wow. Okay, but something nudged my friend, similar to Nehemiah, to give a different response. Politely and with kindness, my friend said, I appreciate your desire to help, and absolutely that would help. But to be frank, a gift of 50000 would fully fund us for the first year, and then I could spend my time and energy working with training people, getting things on the ground, getting ready to go, rather than going out and having to raise funds. Now, the, the parent was caught off guard and was quiet for a moment, then started laughing and said, <laughs> you are going to be successful in this. I can just tell. The boldness of what you've, the way you've coached our kids and, and everything else is coming through. And so, yes, I will donate $50,000. And thank you for letting me be a part, part of something that I think is going to be just awesome. And that's what God led Nehemiah to do with the king. And the king responded much the same way that my friend experienced. And that's important. we got to see that. Be bold. Be ready to go. But there's one less lesson that we need to let, let see in this text. And it really does, it has to do with timing. When Sambalat, the Horonite, the Tobiah, the Ammonite official heard of my arrival, they were very displeased that someone had come to help the people of Israel. So I arrived in Jerusalem three days later. I slipped out during the night, taking only a few others with me. I had not told anyone about the plans God had put in my heart for Jerusalem. We took no pack animals except the donkey I was riding. After dark, I went through the valley gate, past the jackal's well, and over to the dung gate to inspect the broken walls and burned gates. Then I went to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but my donkey couldn't get through the rubble. So though it was still dark, I went up the Kidron Valley instead inspecting the wall before I turned back and entered again at the valley gate. The city officials did not know I'd been out there or what I was doing, for I had not yet said anything to anyone about my plans. I would not yet spoken to the Jewish leaders, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or anyone else in the administration. But now I said to them, you know very well what trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. Then I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been on me and about my conversation with the king. They replied at once, yes, let's rebuild the wall. And so they began the good work. On this slide, you can see the, the, the entire circumstance, circumference, the outside, is the existing city today. But the inside, the smaller, darker, is the, the walls that Nehemiah is writing about. This is what the city walls would have been 
in his day. But the lesson for us is this, is keep your vision guarded until the time is right. No, wait a minute. Hear me out. Nehemiah didn't go around telling everyone his vision too early. He didn't do it in Susa, and he didn't do it in Jerusalem. He waited. He prayed four months until finally it was so heavy on his heart, and God had given him the green light, and the king noticed his sadness. Even then, after the king answered his request, and he made the long journey to Jerusalem, for the first few days, he kept it to himself. Why? Why would he need to do that? What lesson does this have for us? It's really simple. There are some that will hear about the big impossible task that you feel God's calling you to do, and, and they might not even know that they're doing it or, or want to do it, but they trample your dream. They'll remind you of all the reasons you can't do it or why it's a bad idea to start, and of all the people who have tried before, and, well, you're not nearly as qualified as they were, and, and here's the deal. I, I'm the first to admit that oftentimes that's happened. I, I need to hear the words of other people. I need to seek their counsel. I need to get their guidance. And sometimes that helps me to, to, to correct, to rewrite. You need to move this over here or do this. That's wise. That's counsel. But there are other times it's like the immediate response is, that'll never happen. You can't do that. That'll never work. See, if God gives you a burden for something, give him time to strengthen and clarify his vision for you through prayer, fasting, and waiting. Then as he opens the door, be bold and act, but even then, carefully guard who and when you share your vision. Because it's too easy to get sidetracked. I, 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 in some of my examples, I start talking about it. I get excited, and I, and I talk too much. And I've learned, you've got to dial it back. You've got to pull it back. Or be very selective who you bounce ideas off of. Because if they come back with hesitation, reservation, or even bluntly say it can't be done, I'm going to be tempted to, well, maybe I was looking at it wrong. Or, or maybe it can't be done. Or, or maybe I put it on a shelf really high to look at later. When it's of God, we don't want to do that. So when the time was right, he shared with the officials of the city what he'd come to do. And again, like the king, he was met with a favorable reply. And so they began building the walls. Friends, when we take on a prog project that seems impossible, as God leads, as God provides, the impossible becomes possible. Nehemiah reminds that, us of that. We can see example after example in the scripture. Same thing happening. But, but I want to encourage you. Today in 2021, there are a lot of impossible situations in the world around us. Many would say things beyond the powers of people like you and me to change. But Nehemiah reminds us God uses people just like us, that he powers with, with his unlimited power, resources to bring change to the world. In the words of Jesus in the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, a couple questions we can ask ourselves. First of all, what has God given you a concern about? And are you willing to move beyond somebody should do something about that thinking? Are you willing to wait, pray, fast, and seek God's direction? And when God opens the door, will you be bold and will you walk through it? Friends, when God puts a burden on our heart, we need to follow Nehemiah's example and see what God just might be able to accomplish through somebody just like us. Would you pray with me? Father, I, I, it's been said already today, but all of us are at different places. We have different concerns and burdens on our life. Some of those have been weighing us down and we're struggling to get through the day to the next day. But Father, I, I just pray that you'll do in us what you did in Nehemiah. That you'll take those hurts, those concerns, those sorrows and turn them into something that you help us move beyond ourselves, as you lead, as you guide, as you direct. To not just talk about it, but to do something about it. 
Father, just give us great wisdom, give us great insight. And Lord, may we help change the world for your glory. We pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have questions about who God is and how he can work in your life, what he wants to do, how you can have a relationship with him in such a way that you can feel it when he's pressing on you, when he's encouraging, when he's leading you and guiding you, the first step that needs to be taken is to come to him and say, God, here I am. I need you. I need your, lo I need your lordship in my life. I need you because I can't do it on my own. If, if that's where you're at, let's talk. Let's pray. Let, let's see how you can take the most important step that any of us can make, and that's to let Jesus be Lord of our life. But if you're sitting here this morning and you've got things that you see that you are, are burdened, and start praying, God, how can you use me? I, I, I give this counsel a lot, especially to my sons. When they're, when they're sharing with dad about the different things that are going on, the frustrations, the discouragement. And I'll ask the question that's been asked of me. Have you prayed about it as much as you've talked about it? And that always gets me right. It's like, okay, fine. Good reminder, God. That waiting. That praying. Fasting. Going without food so that we can draw near to him and be reminded that only he can feed us, ultimately, spiritual food. I'm excited about this series. I pray we're going to learn a lot from Nehemiah. We're going to learn a lot from how God worked in his life and how he can take that which seems impossible and make it possible, but it's only through God. Next week, Pastor Jacob's going to help set more of the background of what caused Jerusalem to be in the state it was before Nehemiah went there. Some of the answers of how we have to get our spiritual house in order before we can fix the physical house. And that's going to help us have a better idea of the destruction that took place in their lives was not just the physical of the city. The next week, Ben Williams is going to be here. He's going to share some insights into Nehemiah, his work of rebuilding the walls in the city and, and dealing with some of the opposition that he faced. And, and, and friends, these are good things for us to learn. These are good things for us to hear. It's going to be a good month. So let's go now and let's start thinking and praying about what projects, what plans God might have in store for each one of us and even coming together as we watch, as we pray, as we wait for his plans and purposes to be done in and through his faithful children. Amen? God bless you. Have an amazing week. We're dismissed.